Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. So last episode you were packing up a straight line engine, getting ready to, to ship it off. Now you're getting rid of a, a lathe, potentially? Like, whatever happened to N plus one? It's, I normally, I, normally I don't divest myself of lathes after I've purchased them because, as you say, N plus one is the correct number of lathes to own. But I'm considering getting rid of my South Bend 16 by 36 lathe. It is a very large lathe and it takes up a lot of space in the shop. And I'm, I don't really use it nearly as much as I did. Uh, and frankly, it's not really an appropriate size lathe for most of the work that I do anymore. And so I'm thinking about getting rid of it. My Cromwell can do the threading that I was able to do on the uh, on the South Bend. So from a threading point of view, that was one of the big reasons why I kept it. It is a great lathe for doing threading on. But it's really a, a big, big lathe. And, um, you know, I just don't do that scale of work most of the time. And even if I need to do tooling or whatever, I can usually make tooling smaller than, you know, small enough that it'll fit on the Cromwell. And then uh, if I do need something bigger than that, I'm better off shopping it out to somebody and getting a job shop to do the work for me. And this is what, you know, Rich and I often joke about the fact that if we can't make it in the shop, it's not worth making. <laughs> and, you know, the, it's sort of tongue in cheek. But the reality is that if we can't make it in the shop, it probably means that it's large enough or specialized enough that we shouldn't be doing it. And it, we would be better off sending it to somebody else to do because it's a one-off thing or a specialized thing. We ran into this with the water jet cutting with cutting up blanks for my watch cases. And that's the sort of work where I would rather send that work to a job shop to have parts water jet cut than get a water jet cutter in the studio. I mean, as much as fun as it would be to have a water jet here, the reality is that I just don't have enough need for something like that. And with service easily available here locally, I'm, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to get a water jet just to be able to do that kind of work. And I, I think that I've sort of gotten to that point and realization with the South Bend where I just don't need a lathe that size. And it's a big 3,500-pound piece of cast iron that's oh, sitting in the shop. Oh, I know. We we moved that thing. <laughs> it, is, it is huge. Yeah, it really is big. And, you know, so if there's anybody local, I, I mean, you don't have to be local. I'm happy to ship it to you if you want, but... If you know 3,500 pounds is expensive to move around and ship, so if there's anybody local listening that wants a, a big lathe, I'm uh, I'm willing to part with it for a very reasonable price. So that'll probably go up for sale locally sometime in the next few weeks. But but it is not n minus one. No, no, no. It's not n minus one. Uh, it is n. It is even with the subtraction of a South Bend lathe, I have just added a Shoblin 102 to the shop. I managed to find one through my local crack dealer. He, uh, I was in there the other day and he said, hey, Chris, take a look at this. And I'm like, mm. and he showed me the bed from a, a 102. And, uh, and I said, do you have the rest of it? And he did. So yeah, I just added a, a nice early 70s Shoblin 102 to the shop. It's in really good shape. Uh, well, most of it's in really good shape. Uh, that'll be sort of a nice addition and it complements my Cromwell lathe quite nicely as well. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why I've I've been looking for a, a Shoblin. And it has some great accessories for it, everything from milling attachments to, um, you know, rotary tail stocks that can do production work, uh, everything like that. So it's it's really quite a nice machine, and it's very, very flexible in terms of what it can do. Yeah, the lever with the multiple stops on the, the cross slide is something I hadn't seen on a, a Shoblin 102 before. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's me was quite intriguing because you could it, this is was clearly a, a production machine. Yeah, this one has the lever lever cross slide on it, and it it isn't something that you see all the time. And I I don't have one of the dial cross slides, which I do want to get. Uh, I'm looking for a metric dial cross slide for it as well to be able to do just regular turning with it. But these lever between the lever tail stock and the lever cross slide you can set this up for doing production work where you set up stops for different tooling and then you set up the tooling in such a way that it will cut to the exact diameter that you need it to. And you can you can set up the, the lathe to be able to then do, you know, let's say you want to set it up to do screws. If you want to make a couple hundred screws in a day, you can do that with this machine. 
And it takes, you know, it takes a little bit of setup to do it. But this is what people did pre-CNC for mass manufacturing. You would have a room full of operators with these machines, and one person would be sitting there cranking out this particular case screw, and another person would be sitting there cranking out this particular screw that was used in the, you know, in, a, in assembling the bridges, let's say. And you would just sit there turning these parts, and it would it would allow you to very quickly machine accurate parts without needing to sit there and, you know, constantly be measuring every single part diameter and everything like that as you're working. Yeah, this lathe was clearly well employed. I actually didn't recognize it as a showman <laughs> when you first sent me a, a picture of it, uh, primarily because of the, the paint color and then sort of the, the way in which it was all put together. And again, I hadn't, hadn't seen that particular cross slide or tailstock before on, on a showman. Um, so it seems you have uh, some work cut out for you in terms of actually getting this piece up and running. Yeah, this wasn't, uh, it wasn't ideal timing in terms of getting another project in the shop because obviously I'm heads down right now on finishing bridges and, and getting those movements working and getting these, these watches made. So for me, that's, that's my primary focus right now is getting that kind of work done. So this lathe will probably sit on a shelf for the next six months until I get sort of a week or two of time to be able to sit down and really do a deep clean on it. I might repaint it. Uh, certainly it needs, you know, all of the the lubricants that are in there need to be cleaned out and uh, probably, you know, deglazed a little bit. And then uh, it needs to, to have a new bench made for it because it didn't have a bench with it. So I need to make a proper bench for it with, you know, tooling racks and stuff like that, call it racks, all of, all of that good stuff. And then I'll also go and look out for a proper dial cross slide for it as well, something that I can I can do my normal turning on. And then I'm also going to look for probably one of the tailstocks with the turrets on it for doing production work. And I will also be looking for a milling attachment for it. You know, once I've got all that, I'm probably going to make a, uh, a worm gear for the headstock so I can do easy indexing off mm -hmm. of it. It does have an index plate built into it so you can do some, some indexing without needing a, an attachment. But uh, for the flexibility of being able to do all my indexing and everything like that, I will probably do that. So... Really, this, this lathe was designed as a sort of a watchmaking studio in a box. Like you could set it up, have all the attachments there, and you could make everything that you needed for a watch right on this one machine. The only thing that it's not good for is threading uh, without using a tap or die. So for something like my Cromwell or my South Bend lathe, it has a lead screw on it, which drives the carriage and can be timed to the rotation of the headstock, the spindle, and that allows you to do arbitrary threading with it. That's something that the Shoblins have never really been good at. There, there are a couple of, of accessories that they made for it to allow you to do some threading, but they're really not very good compared to a proper lead screw and, you know, in carriage. So that sort of work I can leave to the Cromwell and then everything else, you know, this would, this will certainly do the job. So yeah, they they really are a, a, an amazing little machine once you, uh, you accessorize them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's clear. There are quite a few coats of, of paint on this over <laughs> yes, the years. Uh, you can see it sort of chipped through there. That's actually what threw me the most. I'm mm. not accustomed at all to, to seeing uh, the show blends in, in this particular hue uh, that's currently on there. Oh, will you be stripping the old paint off? You think, I'm or? thinking about it. Yeah. I, I may, I may strip the old paint off, re give it a fresh coat of paint. I may not stick to the, the traditional shovel and colors. I may do something Let's go matte black, matte black. Yeah, kind of I'm not sure that I'd matte black it, but maybe, maybe a, a semi gloss black. I might do that. Mm -hmm. A lot of my machines I've, I've repainted that. So I may, I may do that. Yeah. It's, it's a, you know, it's a great little machine to have. And I'm, I'm happy to have that because I, I do want to make sure that I've got ways of working that are not just technology based. So, not just CNC based, and also ma make sure that I can make things using other means other than just manual means as well. Uh, the number of watches that I intend to make in a year, you know, I, I don't need really high production. Like I don't need to buy a high end Swiss lathe or something like that for putting out, you know, 100,000 screws a year. I can make a year's worth of screws on this lathe in a day or two, right? If I set it up properly. So I'm happy to do that kind of that kind of work on here if I need to. I don't need to buy a quarter million dollar lathe to be able to do, you know, CNC, that kind of stuff. And uh, and this will give me the flexibility to do it easily and produce a lot of them in sort of a short period of time. Hmm. 
So you didn't just manage to, to square yourself a, a show blend with a, a bunch of, of pieces with it here locally, uh, along with uh, quite a, a number of call-outs that, that came with it. Mm. Uh, but you also, by happenstance, came upon someone just across the river who had a whole bunch of, of call-outs just sitting around for this thing? It was it was kind of funny because this has a, a W25 call-out headstock on it. So the the standard call-out that you find on a problem 102 is a W20 call-out. The, the shanks on them are 20 millimeter, and these are 25. So they've got a slightly larger capacity than the 20s do, but they're also less common, and um, and they're you know they're not quite as easy to find. And it's it's nice because they the tailstock also happens to use the same collets on them, so you can mount whatever you want in the in there using the exact same collets. And I have alerts set up on eBay for W20 collets as well as W25 collets. Um, because my W20 collets will fit inside of my Cromwell headstock quite nicely, they're actually the same size and dimensions as the hardened 4500 collets that it takes. They just use a different thread on the back of it that you use on the um, the draw the draw bar with. So I, I'm looking around for W20 collets as well, just because then I have a better selection for the the Cromwell. And uh, I got an alert one morning. Uh, from eBay, and it's like, oh, there's, you know, he's, this new this new set of W20 collets is up on, on eBay. And when I looked, the seller was just over the river in Gatineau. And so I contacted him and said, you know, are you interested in, you know, would you be willing to do a local pickup? And uh, he was, and he happened to have a nice, um, a nice large collection of W25 collets there as well. And so I, you know, I went over to, to pick those up. Now, these collets were absolutely abused by whoever owned them beforehand. Uh, they obviously had been used in some kind of a grinding setup, and uh, a lot of the collets themselves have actually been ground into, which is which is hilarious. Now, most of them are in pretty good shape, but a couple of them were pretty heavily abused, and they were mostly random collets, so it's not as if it's a full set or anything like that. But it did give me a larger selection than what I have, and some of the ones that are really, really bad... I can repurpose them for other things. I can, you know, I can weld shafts into them and turn them into, you know, hard mounts for different chucks and things like that. So I do have some some options of what I can do with these collets, but they're some of them are just, they're just hilariously mangled and chewed up. Yeah, I, I don't think I've seen collets that have been more abused than, than <laughs> some of the ones you showed me. Whoever was using these collets just, just had zero respect for the machine <laughs> no, they really or, or the, yeah. the people who made these <laughs> collets previously. They're precision collets and somebody has taken deep gouges out of them with a grinder. That's absolutely brutal. Okay. And they're, they're hardened steel, so they absolutely would have had to have been a grinder that was that was grinding into these things. Yeah, they're, they're really, it's, it's really bad. I've, I mean, I've driven a CNC lathe into a chuck once, to a 5C collet chuck, and, you know, it was a carbide bit in the in the cutter and the hardened steel of the chuck did not survive uh, under the, you know, the onslaught of the carbide cutter. But even then, so, I mean, some of my chucks have, have absolutely had some scars on them, but the, you know, you really have to work at it to get these, to, to damage a set of call-outs the way these guys did. Yeah. On the bright side, there there are certainly far more in, in good condition than others. It's only, yeah. he had them in two separate boxes. He was actually selling them in two different batches, and I ended up buying them all as a all as a complete mm -hmm. unit because I'm like, you're not going to sell those those really bad <laughs> ones for you know for uh, for anything for for a lot of money. <laughs> scrap, so scrap metal yeah, there. nobody's going to pay to ship those somewhere. But uh, so I just bought the whole lot of them, and and I'm you know I'm happy for it. As I said, I can I'm sure that there are going to be some duplicates from the ones that I already got with the lathe as well as these. And the ones that are really bad, I can regrind them into something useful and actually turn them into a into a different thing. I've got some some bezel chucks for my Cromwell lathe, and I may just go off and and remount those for the sh for the Shoplin. And I could just use a couple of the really bad collets and re you know sort of redo them as actual you know hard mounts for those bezel chucks. Uh, so that that may be what ends up happening with them. Yeah, it is fortunate that these particular collets there were eaten alive, grounded into, <laughs> just horribly abused. It is fortunate that they protrude as far out from the mm -hmm. headstock as they do, yeah. because that does leave you a lot of material to, to work with, to yeah. turn these into other sorts of, of fixtures and, and jigs and, and work holding aids. 
they can, yeah, the front's off, it can be ground off of them quite easily and, and you wouldn't necessarily know. And in fact, that may, may, some of them may be recoverable to the point where all I need to do is just grind the, the, the worst of them off of it. They may end up being use, perfectly usable collets like that. And if you looked at it afterwards, you may not even realize that that's what's happened with them. So we'll see what happens. I'll, I'll give them a grind and see what, see what comes out of them. And, but they're, uh, they're pretty bad the way they are now grind the ground collets in a, a more yes. humane fashion. Yes, that's right. Put them out of their misery. <laughs> but unfortunately, it does mean that I now have another set of collets that I'm collecting in the shop. I mean, you just had a few you were keeping track of before. <laughs> what did we get up to when Six, I was counting eight, them? No, there was, I think there was close to I was just 10. running through the W's there. I, <laughs> I think, no, you were, you were definitely in the, into the double digits. Uh, Got to be pushing close to, to twenty different style of collets uh, that you, it's you're juggling. It's so frustrating how many different collets. Why can't we just have, you know, standardized collet sets? Every every company seems to have this need to create another standard. Well, what's what's the joke about standards in the in the IT industry? Like when you when you collect a, a large enough number of horrible standards, that you get a standards committee together to create a new standard that you know just adds to the the problem. And so you now you've got got another standard to deal with, and then they supplant their own standard every couple of years. Yeah. These, yeah, collets are collets are always a problem, and and of course some of them are more common than others. Some stuff like my five C collets are very very trivial to find. You know they're they're very easy to to come across in the world because they're they're such a popular uh, Hardinge made such a popular collet size with that. But then I've also got four C collets that are from Hardinge. I've got the forty five hundred collets from Hardinge. You know, there's, you know, they they made their own, they made a whole series of their own collets. I think there's a 3C collet system as well that's out there from Hardinge. So even just in that company, they've made probably dozens of different collet sizes. And I know I've got at least two or three of them right now. So it's, it is a little bit frustrating when you, you know, you get this whole collection of stuff and, and it would be nice to be able to just use the same collets over and over again in different places. Drowning in a sea of collets. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not good. So. I, I may alleviate some of that problem by doing things like making an adapter for my 10 millimeter collets that I have in my Darby and make an adapter for like the Shoblin 102 and the Cromwell so that I can actually use those 10 millimeter collets in those bigger lathes. And the reason I would do that is because I have a much better selection of collets in very, very fine increments in the 10 millimeter size. So I've everything up to, um, you know, up to the eight millimeter max that they come in. I have in 0.1 millimeter increments. So I can do very, very fine increment changes in terms of collet sizes with the 10 millimeter collets. And of course, nobody's made that large a selection of collets for the Shoblin or the Hardinj mills or anything like that. So this would give me a lot of flexibility and, and sort of I could get very, very precise work holding with those 10 millimeter collets if I built them out like that. Yeah, that is a, a truly superb set of, of collets that you have there for, for the 10 mils. The price that you paid to get those with, with the lathe, yeah. uh, I think more than justified that, that purchase. Absolutely, but it's still, it's painful when that comes down to it. So I don't know, we may, you know, if I decide to downsize a little bit more, depending on what happens with shop space down the road, I may, you know, get rid of things like the Darby, uh, just because with something, with a combination of the, the Shoblin and the Cromwell, it would be pretty tough to justify having the Darby here as well. Uh, you know, might set it up for something very specific, like set up for very, you know, very specific type of um, of turning. So we'll see what happens with all of these lays, but uh, the N plus one can't keep going forever, and I'm afraid. It's just a slippery slope. It sounds <laughs> like you're you're edging closer and closer to the N minus one. Yeah, I need to. You know, if I if I start acquiring more lays, I may have to kick Rich out of the out of the space and. <laughs> And uh, take over his his side of the uh, the woodworking side of things and and start filling it with lays. Which woodworking lays? <laughs> and this is the reason too that the the Shoblin seventy is quite popular among right. a lot of watchmakers because the the collets are interchangeable with with things like the the F one, and so you can can switch back and forth very easily uh, between your your two machines and, and have the same set of collets for for all of that. And it's nice that you have the possibility. Uh, to be able to make adapters so that you can use your right. 10 mil collets in your other tools so that you can take advantage of, of how precise those increments are between mm -hmm. the various collets and then have the versatility of being able to use them across your, your machines. It absolutely is is true. The the 
Shoblin tools were absolutely made to be as flexible as possible. And you see that when you look at the range of accessories that were mm-hmm. available for them and the and how many other companies adopted their call-it systems for things like their mills and whatnot. And it's too bad that I don't think there's, maybe I'm wrong, if somebody out there knows um, if there's a mill that takes the uh, W20 or W25 call-its, I'd be curious to know that. I don't think there is. I know that the milling attachments for the Shoblin 102 take the W20 call-its. And I think that's how they get around that. But I don't think anybody like Sixus or uh, Asier, I don't think either of them made mills that take the W20 or W25 call-its. But if they did, that would be great because then I could, you know, maybe add a small mill to the shop that would do that. Because my hardened mill, which is a good size, it takes uh, 4C call-its in, in that headstock. So, And I don't have a great selection of those. I have sort of, I, I have a dozen of those in sort of imperial, um, sort of a standard imperial set of uh, call it for that so it's not a it's not an ideal although that one's not so bad because you're holding work holding uh, tools so things like end mills and whatnot so they tend to be standardized to certain diameters and that's mm-hmm. not it's not like work holding with a with a part that you're turning so uh, the flexibility of the number of calls you have in something like a mill is not quite as important as as it is with a um, with a lathe yeah i don't know offhand of, of any mills that, that take the w20 or w25s but uh if you, dear listener, happen to know of one, please, please do let us know. Just yeah. give us a little shout out. Hello at offhours.show. You can send us uh, an email or, you know, of course, reach out to, to Chris on Twitter or your Instagram at silver underscore hand. Is that yeah, correct? Do I got that's that? Right. All right, perfect. Silver underscore hand everywhere that's important. So you may not be painting your Shoblin the blackest black, but uh, Stuart Semple has, has delivered some more blackest black there is material. Uh, they recently released Blink, which is uh, the blackest ink on the planet. Now, uh, unfortunately for you, this isn't the sort of ink you'd be able to, to stick into a pen, but uh, I think it would be very fitting for, for something like a, a watch dial, filling in the engraved numerals and the like. I missed the beta email that they sent out for this because I've, I've purchased other products from them before I, I get some of the beta emails, and I, I just sort of blasted over it and, and deleted it. And uh, I should have ordered some of it and to experiment with. I think it might actually be really nice for doing dials and filling in dial indices and things like that, uh, where you're you're engraving away parts and and filling it in. Uh, so I, I need to get some of this and try it out. I, we've tried using their Black 3.0 on a sample dial that we made for Project Minotaur, and it looks really good. I think it's it's easy to work with, and it was uh, in that kind of context, and I think it would look really great. I'm curious to see how this changes things, if it's how they've modified the formula to make it easier to work with. I think it's maybe a little bit less viscous than the uh, Black 3.0, and uh, that might be more appropriate for doing dial work. So we'll have to see. I I need to order some of this and try it out. Mm -hmm, Certainly. I I think it would be uh, much more appropriate to this sort of use case, and particularly with the the way that, that that particular dial experiment was designed. I think the way I would approach it with Blink is to polish the, the upper surfaces, mm-hmm. and then I would squeegee the ink into the, the recesses. And then because it is less viscous and there's more water content there, or whatever the carrier is, as that carrier evaporates, more of that ink is, is going to, the volume of the ink is going to disappear, and it's going to shrink down into the, the recesses. Whereas using Black 3.0, which is the, the paint, painting over everything and then sanding that away and then polishing it, you lose out on some of the benefits of Black 3.0 because anywhere mm. where the paint was sitting proud of the dial, it ends up getting ground away. And mm. um, it, while not as easy to notice because of the... Matte nature of it, yeah. Properties, yeah, the, the, the properties of the, the Black 3.0 and, and just how much light it absorbs. It's not super noticeable, but under a loop it is noticeable that there is a difference between the material that was sanded away mm-hmm. versus the material that was just left to dry. So the, the upside of, of using something like uh, the Blink ink is that uh, it would, should all just go right into the recesses exactly where you want it, squeegee off the top. It's mm-hmm. not where you don't want it. And then as it dries, it pulls in and then becomes that that nice, deep, rich, blackest black ink uh, that you can get. So even blacker than, say, uh, an India ink yeah. that George Daniels and, and the you know Breguet used on, on their timepieces. I, I think that I, if I were using, if I'm going to continue using the Black 3.0, I'd have to do a second layer of it just to make sure that you do get it all consistent and it's all being ground down. But you're right, you do end up having to sort of grind it off and 
to get that flat layer and that that's not quite ideal and it can affect the the matte properties of it as well mm-hmm. so i'd be curious to try this this might also be more appropriate to put something like a pad printer as well mm-hmm. so it may Absolutely. be it may be thin enough that you can do that and i would i would certainly try that in my pad printer just to see how it actually functioned even if you had to water it down slightly to to be able to get it to flow properly into very thin print plates for the pad printer it would be very interesting to try because that might end up getting you a really gorgeous deep black you know matte black out of your pad printer mm-hmm. which you couldn't get otherwise i imagine well given given the proximity to the steward symbol we'll probably be, be seeing some of this black ink in some mr jones watches in the not too distant here. yeah i'd be curious to try and see if they if they ever try it out or if they've given it a shot um i know the the paint was definitely too thick to to really go through the pad printer you'd have to water it down quite a bit and i don't know how much that would affect the properties of it mm. but with the uh, this ink it might uh, might actually work well so we'll we'll try it out and see uh, see how it works i i still haven't really done any any playing around with the pad printer yet but i think i'm going to need to start doing that soon uh, once I get these bridges finished, then I can start working on some dial work, and I I need to experiment with printing on that uh, that pad printer. And on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, since the last time we we talked about Black 3.0 or you know, Vanta Black, some of these blackest black surface treatments that exist out there, um, some scientists have uh, come out with the uh, the whitest paint ever. Uh, so that, that's kind of neat to see. I, I haven't seen anyone yet use the two in contrast with each other, <laughs> but I, I think it'd be fascinating to see a, an art installation or, or some use case, of perhaps even in a watch, uh, where someone uses a, a something like a Vanta Black or Black 3.0 in contrast with this hyper white paint. I think that would be, I'm just thinking about that from a photography and video point of view, and that's absolute hell for anybody who's trying to trying to film or photograph that uh, that combination because the extremes and contrast would just be so difficult to actually photograph. I mean, at that point, you'd basically be blowing out the whites and completely crushing your blacks and you'd never be able to see anything. It would basically be two, two extreme points on your on your graph when you're when you're trying to edit it. So uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind with me is just how hellish that would be to photograph. Well, you certainly wouldn't have anyone complaining that uh, your dial... The contrast is, is isn't strong enough for them. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, you could say that that would definitely give you very very high contrast. I, I don't know how much I would use a, a super white white like that. It's it's an interesting idea and it's an interesting concept, but I don't know how much of a, how much use I would actually find with that practically. I think that the black blacks are far more interesting to me, especially because a lot of what I'm doing is on polished metals. So the black actually gives you that contrast with the polished metals, or even. Even if it's a textured metal, you get a much better contrast with it. The white would be virtually unreadable on on a lot of the the metals that I use. Yeah, I think you would have to use it judiciously. Mm. Certainly, the the use case here is much harder on the eyes. I mean, the yeah. black is black might be be hard on the the psyche. Yeah, perhaps if if you're surrounded by <laughs> a, a lot of it. Uh, but but I do agree with you that the the white is much harder on the eyes than than the black is. And indeed, the, the use case for this particular paint is actually to help reduce air conditioning costs hmm. in, in really hot areas by painting roofs and buildings right. with this whitest white paint. You're able to reflect the vast amount of heat from hmm. the sunlight that's, that's beating down on, on these buildings. And you're able to reject that and bounce that back up in, into the atmosphere. I can see that being a really great use for it. And I, but I, yeah, and, and something practical like that, where again, you're, you're reflecting infrared that would be super useful i but something like um using it as a as a design element i think it would be really challenging to to use i i'm i hope to see somebody do it i'm i'm sure that somebody will figure it out but it would be uh, i know just sort of thinking about it myself like dealing with very very high polished things has a lot of challenges mm-hmm. even in and of itself and this this would cause even more problems than the high polished items would and speaking of photographing watches gary g uh, recently published an, an article on what he's been up to during various lockdowns and, and what he's, he's learned photography-wise during the, the pandemic. And uh, I myself have generally been quite averse to, to using a flash in, in most of my photography. Um, I do like to use a, a light box, and he did use a light box when doing a lot of the photographs of, uh, say, for instance, that timepiece that was from the Canadian Horological Institute. 
I've always been a little scared of using a flash. <laughs> I, I often don't like the results that come from a flash, particularly, say, on a, a phone camera where you're mm. using a flash directly on a subject. I find that the way to get the best results with a flash is to be bouncing it off of, of other objects. But uh, th- this was interesting to me, and, and he picked up uh, a number of pointers from Ming Thing, who uh, is the owner of Ming Watches, and uh, who has actually uh, quite renowned for his, his product photography. And he worked at, at Hasselblad for... Uh, quite a time as well and uh, he nudged and encouraged gary to to take a shot at using some flashes in his watch photography and his mac photography it was enlightening to to read his experience and and learning and going through this process i mean he certainly admits that he hasn't mastered it yet Mm. Uh, it's still a a work in progress and and a learning Uh, but he's certainly much further along uh, in this journey than i am myself And, and he has learned from someone who has mastered a lot of this and it's uh, very kind of him to be passing along some of those learnings. I did a lot when I was doing more pen work. And I did experiment a lot with flash photography. I had some inexpensive studio strobes that I was using for it. And there there's certainly some challenges with it. The strobes that are available on the market today, especially the smaller ones, like the camera-mounted sort of sized ones, they are much better than they were five or ten years ago. There's really been a renaissance in that even though there aren't as many people doing strobe photography anymore, uh, especially when you're dealing with things like people photography or outdoor outdoor photography or whatever, the camera sensors are getting so good now that you can shoot in lower light conditions than you could five or ten years ago and get better results. So there, there's less and less demand for flash photography. Like, I don't think I've taken a photo on my phone with a flash ever. And, you know, I've got a, a D810 that I shoot with. I don't know that I've ever shot a flash photo outside of product photography with that ever. So there, you know, there's certainly less demand for flash photography these days for, for what most people shoot in terms of their subject matter. But for product photography, it's really tough to beat good flash photography for product photography. And Gary has some great tips in here on how to do it. He's using a slightly less expensive flash system than some of the, the first party ones like a Nikon or a Canon one is. And the, he's using them very effectively. You have to get good at modifying the light as well. So putting in things like flags to, especially with things like watches and jewelry and whatnot, where you have a lot of reflections mm-hmm. and a lot of weird surfaces that you that you get to light bouncing off of. It really is a challenge and an art to to actually get a good photograph of some of this this stuff. I tend to stay away from flash photography these days for my product work because a lot of what I'm doing now, I want to be able to video as well. And flash just does not work with video. You can't, you know, there's no point in having a a 400th of a second flash of light when you're trying to shoot, you know, 30 seconds at 24 frames a second. It just doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't make a difference with that and it doesn't really add enough light. So I've, I've been focusing all of my work on using constant light sources and that's improved dramatically over the years as well. You know, shooting with LED lights. Um, you know, we've we've got a bunch of the aperture uh, lights here in the studio, and can pump a huge amount of light into an area, and then modify it in various ways. So, I, I tend to focus on the continuous light sources, but it's really really tough for still photography to to max out your light compared to what you can do with um, with flash photography, and it really does allow you to use you know, much, much smaller uh, aperture sizes on your camera so you can get better depth of field when you're photographing the products. And uh, you do have a lot of control and you can get a lot of light in places. But certainly if you're you're getting into product photography, this particular article from Gary, uh, Ming also put out a good article a few years ago that he wrote. A lot of that's more about the the focus of, of, of the photography, like how to create a good setup for it and things like that in terms of the the visuals of what you're looking at as opposed to light shaping and things like that. So he's he's got a couple of good articles about that as well. And uh, he is a he excellent, excellent photographer. Gary is probably one of the best watch photographers in the world right now as well. Um, I always enjoy looking at his, his work. And this is where places like Instagram drive me crazy because they so heavily compress the work. It's really tough to see Gary's photos in all their glory just because... Instagram just destroys them in turn with compression, so it is frustrating not to see them at a higher resolution. It would be nice to nice to get a a bigger version and a less compressed version of what he's shooting. I certainly agree with you. 
that that article from Ming uh, a few years ago was, was excellent as well. And he dives into some other techniques that are really important for macro shots, like focus stacking, mm -hmm. which is something we, we've talked about here on, in the past mm -hmm. on the show before. It was great to get his, his perspective on that. I, I would love to have, have seen this video that he sent along to, to <laughs> Gary as well. But unfortunately, that does not seem to be, be public. I don't think that's going to be public domain, no, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm focus stacking is an excellent technique. If you don't know how to do focus stacking and you want to do product photography, it is absolutely essential to getting good quality uh, macro photography. I I really need to dig back into it again. It's been a couple of years since I've done a deep focus on on any kind of product photography, but with these watches starting to come together, I've been photographing some of the work that I've been doing in the polishing and video, some of that work as well, and experimenting with some of what I need to do. I'm finding that I, you know, I'm working on much smaller areas now than I was in the pen world. So I'm finding that my one-to-one -one reproduction on my macro lenses is not enough. So starting to figure out ways of getting up to like a two-to-one um, reproduction on that, even figuring out things like how to use my microscope properly for shooting shots. Unfortunately, the, the optics in my microscope and the lighting in my microscope are not spectacular. So there, it's not a great solution for actually photographing what I'm doing. So it's it's an interesting challenge and it's sort of a fun world to get into but it it warning it is a a very deep dive and there is a lot of gear acquisition syndrome that comes out of getting into macro photography of products mm -hmm. yeah the first time i had ever encountered the concept of, of focus stacking was actually it had to do with uh, the the ipod like one of the the early ipods uh, mm. the photographer who who had photographed it put up a tutorial and yes. uh, I, I was very grateful to have been able to take the article in before Apple forced them to take it down. <laughs> yeah, I, I was surprised to learn through that that all of the the product shots mm -hmm. from Apple that you see in, the, in their stores and stuff. I mean, this was back in the the early two thousands. None of it was computer renders. Like yeah. it was all, all actual photographs done by photographers, and the results they were achieving was the result of multiple photographs taken at a macro level, and then stacked and, and stitched together into one continuous photo where absolutely everything is is in focus mm -hmm. and, and that's why they, they almost seem like computer rendered yeah. versions because it's not how you would be accustomed to seeing a product with your naked eye or through the the lens of, of a camera just in a single shot now yeah, focus stacking really does give you the ability to create a much deeper depth of field than you would otherwise be able to get and some of that you can get through things like bellows uh, medium format cameras traditionally had the option of adding a bellows onto them and they would allow you to change the angle of the plane of focus which is always interesting and gets you some some really cool photos that you can take with it and especially when it comes to product photography it allows you to to take a slice of something on the face of it that's not necessarily perpendicular to the uh, or parallel to I should say to the plane of the the camera sensor but there are still limitations to what you can do even with bellows and being able to to shift that um, that lens and really the focus stacking is the best way of being able to do it and the great thing is that it gets you higher resolution in a lot of ways because you can get very very high resolution slices of all of your you know all along your product and then when it comes to editing it afterwards you know you can you can really deep dive in there and get down into the pixels and clean stuff up if you need to and you also can work in the sweet spot of your lens because well, lenses, the optics of them, they definitely have a sweet spot in terms of where they function best and where you're going to get the sharpest image. So that, you know, you can work in that and you don't have to worry about the limitations of that depth of field uh, in trying to capture your entire, your entire product. So uh, there's some, there's some really cool stuff you can do with that. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> the amount of retouching that does go into a lot of product shots uh, by photographers is astounding uh, like yeah. that the subtle changes that they're they're making and the, the hours of work that go into it is not insignificant they, they yeah product photographers put fashion photographers to shame in terms of the amount of editing that goes on afterwards so it, it really is <laughs> amazing there is no way at the level that you're that you're photographing these things there is no way that you can clean and you know, get everything, every little speck of dust and dirt and fingerprints and, fingerprints and everything out of a watch, for instance, at the scale that you're photographing them in, in these, these things. So you do need to be able to go in there and actually clean a little bit of up and, and just there's, you don't have a choice. If you didn't, 
everybody would look at it and go, wow, that looks absolutely horrible. Uh, there, you know, there's no way that you could, you could uh, publish a photo that was not cleaned up. Another video that uh, actually, this time not, not an article, uh, that was uh, issued a takedown notice by, by the company in question. The photographer who had photographed the 50th anniversary version of the, the Rolex Cosmograph Daytona mm. put up a tutorial, or not a <laughs> tutorial, um, just a screen capture of, mm. of him cleaning up the oh, photo. Oh, sure. Um, and, <laughs> and it's just mind-rending, the, the lengths that, that he went to cleaning up this photo. I, I mean, it was it's a photo that has been seen by millions upon millions of people. Mm. So for Rolex, it's absolutely worth paying the, the price and the, the premium to have that kind of work done. Mm-hmm on a photograph. But that was eye-opening and very enlightening for me to see that. And uh, yeah, I, I was grateful to have been able to see it where it was taken down, <laughs> I think within eight hours of it being put up. Coincidentally, I saw it pop up again uh, just a few weeks ago. I haven't gone back to check uh, whether that's been been taken down yet again. But if it's still up, I'll, I'll uh, be sure to include that in the show notes. That'd be interesting to see. And this is where, you know, the, it gets to a point where the megapixel race that people see in cameras has has sort of died to some degree for a lot of photography just because it gets to a point where just adding more and more pixels is not necessarily going to help you when you're taking your photos at the beach or whatever. Uh, you know, There's really only so high a resolution you need. And all of the screens that we're working on are lower resolution. Even doing prints, I mean, you can do full building-sized prints with the, you know, the, the photos that you're taking off of your iPhone. So there's, there's really no need for these ridiculously high megapixel count cameras for... 99% of the photos that are out there. But product photography is one of those places where ridiculously high pixel counts are still in demand just because it allows you to get in even deeper and clean it better and actually get a sharper image out of that. Even if you're printing it at a lower resolution, it really does help. And uh, and it's really in that cleanup that it makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this this article from Gary is definitely worth checking out, even if you're you're not into the, the nuance of, of how we achieve the results. It's a good excuse to, to go in and look at some beautiful photos of like the pieces by the Gronfeld brothers and mm-hmm. Carrie Votilainen and MBNF and Langenzona and the like. Yeah, on top of being a spectacular photographer, Gary also has a very enviable collection of, of watches. So, And these are, I believe, all of the watches that he's photographed for this article are all part of his collection. I think some of them were products that were loaned to him for okay. the purpose of, of photographing uh, for articles for, for Quill and Pat. Mm, okay. uh, but, but a good number of them do belong to him, yeah. Now you touched on the fact that you're using the aperture LED lights for your your video work mm. there, and you recently posted a a lovely little video of you doing some some hand chamfering there to Instagram. And there was a little bit of after our last episode, people were kind of curious about what I was doing, and and uh, so I decided to post a little fifty second clip on Instagram of the work that I was doing there, and the. Um, uh, I think I was working on some 0.3 micron micro mesh. So that's the last level of micro mesh on the bevel before I go off to the polishing compounds. And so you can see sort of a nice close in view of what I'm working on. And of course, one of the challenges when you're working on these surfaces is the perfect reflection of the light coming back off of it. So there are parts of it that are completely blown out because it's just pure white light getting reflected back. But you can see, you know, get a sense of what's going on. And just for context, that surface that's there, the width of it is about 0.2 millimeters in width. So it's a very, very tiny surface that I'm working on, even though when you're looking at it in the, you know, in the video, it looks much larger than that. That's, you know, that obviously is much, um, much smaller than the what you're seeing in the video. And it's a, a tiny little space. So let's break this down a little bit. What went into actually capturing that, the video itself? And then where have you landed in terms of, of your process in terms of achieving the the finish that you're you're getting on on the bevels, the camera setup that I'm using, I've got two cameras right now that are capturing what I'm what I'm working on, and some of it's frustrating because I can't get quite deep enough to show some of the really micro scratches that I'm working with. Because I had to go off and like Rich came into the studio the other day, and I and I had had to put down my stuff because I I had finished polishing this bridge, and I actually had to go back and redo it because. I could still see some very, very fine scratches in the surface of it. So you have to go back several levels of abrasive, get rid of those scratches, and then keep going. And that's very, very difficult to show on camera. Without using, without getting into using a microscope or something, it gets very challenging to actually get in that close with a lens. 
Uh, so I've got two lenses right now that are capturing what I'm doing, or two cameras capturing what I'm doing. One is overhead, and it's using a a 105 millimeter macro lens that is sort of shooting down on top. So it's it's a very similar view to what I'm actually seeing. And then the other camera is actually in front of me, facing towards me, and it's using a 24 millimeter macro lens, and that allows me to see sort of a slightly different view of what's going on than um, than the, the overhead view. And uh, and so that's that's what I've been shooting with lately. I'm still experimenting a little bit with locations of cameras, what works best, what doesn't. Obviously, it's very easy to block out the shot with your hands. It's also very easy to move the area that you're working on out of the focus plane of the camera. So it's it's really challenging to, to capture this well, especially when you're doing it by yourself and you're you know you've moved your workpiece and then you check the the monitors and you realize oh everything is out of focus. So you then have to just slightly adjust the focus point of the cameras and then keep working. So it's a it's a bit of a struggle, but it's I, I'm curious to get it down to where it's it's easier to do because I do want to be able to show people what it is that goes into making these and and what it goes you know, what goes into the, the polishing of these, uh, you know, these really small angles. Now, the light itself that you're, you're using there, you have a, an interesting diffuser on it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly the, the purposes of it in terms of uh, lighting videos and whatnot. Uh, but when I was taking a, a quick look at uh, some of these bevels under the loop, it was playing with my mind a little <laughs> bit because it registered for me some false undulations yeah. in the bevel just because of the the nature of the the black grid that mm. you, you have in, in front of the light there. Um, did you find that was, was playing with you at all as you were working, or is it more diffuse by the time it's actually hitting the area where you're you're working? Uh, so in this case, I've got an Aperture 300D light on top of this, the bench, basically. It's it's facing right down on the bench, and it has a softbox on it. So the, the uh, purpose of the softbox is to take that very, very bright, single point LED light and it diffuses it into a nice soft white light that isn't harsh. And then I've also got a grid on it. And so the grid, what it does is it, it helps focus the light down and it doesn't spread it quite as much. And it just helps control and shape the light a little bit when you're, you know, when you're working. So you don't get quite as much spill into weird areas. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I'm sitting there and parts of me, for instance, are in the are in the place where the light would be shining if I didn't have that grid on. And I don't want me being lit by that. I want the background. I want the floor. I want, you know, the chair, all of that stuff. I want that to have very low lighting because that, that's not the focus of what I'm shooting. And even though it would be out of focus, it would be very distracting if all of a sudden, you know, my white t-shirt or gray t-shirt all, all of a sudden has a lot of light on it. So, the grid helps sort of keep that from that light from spilling too far out uh, outside of the path that I want it to be in. And I, I've gotten used to it. I don't I know where things are, like where the reflections are. And I you have to move those surfaces around all the time when you're looking at them to be able to see how the light changes across a surface. Anyways, that's mm -hmm. the only way you can see these scratches mm -hmm. is by sort of seeing how the interference of light changes off of them. And so that's, I'm, I'm constantly moving the parts anyways as I'm checking them for, you know, scratches and, and polish level. So I, I'm, I don't notice it. It doesn't bother me that much just because I'm, I'm already moving the, the parts around quite a bit. And I imagine the grid would fall off quite a bit more as you are further away from the light. I, w I was up quite a bit yeah. closer to it than I would otherwise have been. I'd have been sitting down in, in the mm -hmm. chair where you're sitting working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's an extra couple of feet between me and the and the light than there was between you. So uh, that certainly does make a difference. Uh, but it's it is nice to have having the the nice big bright light there with the soft box and the grid. It, it all helps to light it properly. And that's a, another problem when you're dealing with macro lenses. You do need a lot more light to be able to to get onto the subject to be able to get a a deep enough depth of field to be able to see what's going on. And it, it, that's a constant challenge. So. This is this is certainly challenging uh, subject matter to, to to light well and photograph and video with you know while you're working and again because you're working with these stupid bright polished surfaces they reflect light at the most inopportune times and 
there's nothing you can do to really stop that in this in the case of what I'm doing here uh, from just bouncing straight back into the camera and and sort of blasting out that part of the of the bezel. And for the the anglage work itself, mm. uh, have you do you feel you hit a consistent routine now with doing these? You've done quite a number of these bridges now. Mm-hmm. Do you feel you, you've hit a rhythm and a flow? Absolutely, I've I've gotten a good rhythm down in terms of the order of operations of what to do. I had to sort of go back and redo a couple of the early ones because I was unhappy with some of the results. But now I'm getting a good sort of workflow from ruby blasting the surfaces, then gold plating them so that that surface doesn't get tarnished at all, and then going back in and doing the anglage on the part. And then I can, you know, and and doing the countersink work and polishing all those surfaces, and then I can go off and plate it again. So there's a lot of there's a little bit of repetition in terms of where I'm going with it, but it it means that I get better quality work at the end of it. I get a better quality surface from the gold plating where I've ruby blasted it because it hasn't tarnished at all. Uh, I found that when I left it for a little bit, it was tarnishing just that little bit, and I I wasn't getting the nice sparkle out of it that I wanted. So this is allowing me to sort of get the best of both worlds. It does mean that I have to go and do a second round of plating on it, but I'm happy with that. And then when it comes to the actual process of, of doing the anglage, I'm certainly happy with where I'm, I'm, I am with that. I've got a couple of tools now that I've created and modified specifically for doing this, and I'm happy and comfortable with where they are. The micro mesh that I'm using, I'm mostly happy with. Uh, we were chatting earlier, and I've decided that I'm also going to add a, a fifth level of micro mesh onto the, the sort of the series that I'm using. Uh, currently, I'm going from a 10 cut file to a nine micron micro mesh. I'm going to go off and start with a 12 micron now um, from the file. And that's, it's just a slightly coarser micro mesh than the nine micron. It'll allow me to clean up the scratches from the file a little bit faster. And even though it's adding another step of polishing into the process, Because it's a little bit coarser than the 9 micron, I'll actually be able to get rid of those file marks faster and be able to move on to the 9 micron, and I don't have to spend as long on the 9 micron as I I am right now. So it's it's kind of counterintuitive. I'm adding another step, but it'll actually make everything faster, and I'll be happier with the results that I'm getting because I'm not spending as long with with that 9 micron. Mm Mm-hmm. And then for the the wood and the the polishing compound side of things, what have you settled on in, in terms of of the the woods that you're using and, and the the polishing compounds? I'm using a African blackwood primarily for my uh, for all of the the polishing compounds, and that's a, a really really nice hard dense hardwood. Uh, it's it machines beautifully. You can do some really great work with it. So I can form it into whatever size shape and um, you know stick that I want for it. And then I can put some some polishing compound on it. So I've got two different polishing compounds I'm using. I'm using the gold Luxor and I'm using a, a red rouge that I use for, for jewelry work as well. And the combination of the two of them and then on that African blackwood really, really does allow me to polish it up to a nice high polish. And uh, it, it goes even further beyond the polish level than the that the that I would get out of the 0.3 micron. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people would be happy with the 0.3 micron micro mesh. Um, you know, if you wanted to get into doing this kind of work and you weren't worried about it being, you know, absolutely to the nth degree and you didn't want to worry about polishing compounds and wooden sticks and things like that, I think most people would be happy with the results that they got off of the 0.3 micron. And it, it really is very close to a perfect black polish just at that level. And you, you gave some gentian a try there, too, but you weren't a big fan of it. That's, that's sort of Philippe Dufour's wood of choice there for the, the anglage. I found the gentian was a little bit too soft, and while it works great, like it, it really does hold the polishing compound well, you don't have to worry about it scratching the material underneath. It gives too readily to the part that's underneath it. And uh, I think, you know, in, in the case of Philippe, he's doing a curved bevel on, on his, and I think it works well for that because it then conforms to the curve mm-hmm. of that angle, you know, that, that angled surface. And that, that's really ideal for what he's doing. Because I'm using a flat bevel on mine, having that surface that's giving, that, that wooden surface that's giving, is actually a detriment because mm-hmm. it's then 
enforcing more of a curve into the part than I want. And I'm losing that perfectly flat surface by doing it. So I found that it was actually a detriment to using it. I can certainly see part, you know, parts would I, that I would finish in the future where it would be absolutely great. Like, for instance, if I was polishing something on the lathe, I would absolutely grab some of that gentian, load it up with buffing compound, and then use it on, on a part on the lathe, like certainly a steel part or something like that that you're turning on the lathe. It would be ideal for that because then it would actually conform a little bit to the round surface and you wouldn't have hard, flat facets being formed because of it. There, I can see absolutely using it in certain environments, but in this one, it, it's just not ideal for, for the type of work that I'm doing here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's rendering a curve where, where you do not want one. Right. And this sort of drills home the, the importance of selecting the right materials to be working with. We talked about this mm-hmm. a little bit last episode with metals and, and making sure that the metals you're working with are, are of good quality and, and sourced from reputable sources mm-hmm. and that, that they are what they say they, they are. Uh, so the same, same thing goes with, with wood. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I could probably write uh, a whole book just about uh, wood used in watchmaking uh, because of all the, the different types of, of wood that exist out mm-hmm. there in the world and, and the various properties that, that it brings to different tasks. I think it's also important to understand that you can't just slavishly copy what someone else is doing and expect it to do the same thing for you. If you've changed, like in this case, if I if I just said I am only going to use the exact materials and tools and techniques that Philippe Defour is using, then I would actually have problems with the way that I have chosen to um, to bevel these parts. And so it's important to understand, okay, this is a tool that he's using, this is a material that he's using, but why is he using this particular one? And why is it appropriate for what he's doing, but it's inappropriate for another place? Mm. All of these tools are just that. They're just a tool. There's nothing mystical or magical about using a particular technique or tool just because somebody happens to use it and they get great effects out of it. If that tool is not using, you know, not working for you or it's not leaving the finish that you want or allowing you to do the thing that you need to do, then understand why it's not doing that and then find the appropriate tool for it. So in this case, the the better tool for me in the case of the wood that I'm using is is absolutely something like African blackwood. You could easily switch that out for something like boxwood or ebony, whatever is is appropriate. Uh, some of the rosewoods might do okay, but I find the problem with the rosewoods is they they have um, a lot of oil in them, and that oil can react poorly with the buffing compounds. Even though it's often very very hard wood, it's it's not quite as nice to work with. So something like an ebony, African blackwood, a uh, boxwood, any of those would do very very well as a very hard wood which you can use for getting very precise flat surfaces. And whereas if you were to try and apply those same woods to achieving a rounded bevel, the way that Philippe Dufour does, you, you'd have the opposite problem. Like you, they would be they, entirely exactly, inappropriate for that. Precisely. Yeah. So they're, they're the right tools. Mm-hmm. They're just being applied to the wrong job. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, that's, and, and again, I see this in every, every art that I've ever studied. There's always some, you know, some master... Maybe it's someone who's alive today. Maybe it's someone who was born 300 years ago. Maybe it's someone who was born a thousand years ago. And there, you know, people will will sort of idolize what it is that they did and basically fetishize what it was that they did and the techniques that they used. And the funny thing is that for so many of these artists, the reason that they were there was because they got to the pinnacle of their art by changing and adapting the existing tools that were out there and using the ones that were best for them they were the innovators of their time. And yes, their work may have survived 300 years, but things have changed since then. Materials have changed. Our understanding of different materials, some things like things like micrograin carbide was not available to Breguet. Well, if Breguet was alive today, he would be using micrograin carbide in his turning tools. Mm -hmm. Just because he didn't have access to it then doesn't mean we shouldn't use that today. So this fetishization of, of particular techniques or masters it's it's important to learn where things have come from and how the art has developed, but it's also to, important to understand where they're inappropriate and where other techniques and materials are better for, for what it is you're trying to do. I think it's worthwhile noting here, too, that Dufour doesn't exclusively use gentian. He also Absolutely. uses ebony in his work when he's polishing the, the countersinks. It just you know, goes that much further to show there are different tools and different materials that are, are applicable to different jobs, and it's all about 
what is your end goal? What, mm-hmm. what are you trying to achieve? And what is the best possible way to, to get there? Mm-hmm. And I know some of the people that I've spoken with when, you know, the, who are doing Anglage, they start with a nine micron micro mesh paper when they go from a 10 cut file. And that's great. I'm glad that it worked for them. I, I'm finding through my experience of doing jewelry work and understanding where the efficiencies can come in in terms of how coarse or fine a, a polishing mechanism you're using can help either speed up or slow down the work that you're doing. I'm finding that the 12 micron would actually be a better choice for me to start with. If that, you know, if something is working for you, then that's great. You don't need to change it. I'm certainly not saying that, oh, because I'm using a 12 micron, everybody should start with that. Maybe a 20 is actually better for what you're doing. Who knows? You have to sort of play with it and figure out what works best for you and, you know, and where that's where that's most appropriate. So it, it is important to experiment with this and learn from what's going on and analyze what you're doing. And that will help you figure out the best way of actually accomplishing what you're trying to do. Now, for actually preparing your wood. You, you've repurposed a, a neat little tool for this. And of course, coincidentally, I, I, I saw the the hand plane that you're using. And then I, I asked if you, you had seen the chopstick <laughs> making kit that they own. And you're like, yes, of course, I'm, I'm using it to to prepare my my little laps, yeah, and my wood funny. laps that I'm making. Yeah, it's funny. Bridge City Tools makes a, a great little jig for making chopsticks. And, uh, and they're Chinese style chopsticks for those who are aficionados of different chopsticks they the kit that, that they have makes chinese style chopsticks which are longer and thicker in diameter at the end than japanese style chopsticks which tend to be shorter and thinner in the end uh, but they do this great little jig that allows you to easily uh, make chopsticks and um, and form them in this in the size and shape that they're supposed to be uh, and it turns out that it's a really great way to hold wood into a jig and then be able to plane it down to the appropriate sizes where you can then start doing uh, watchmaking work with them. So I use that for taking the woods that I want. Uh, you know, they may not necessarily be appropriate woods for making chopsticks out of and using for eating, but they're great for doing watchmaking work. So yeah, the the little hand planes and the little jigs that they make for that are, are excellent for producing, uh, repeatably producing pieces of wood that I can then use for the watchmaking that I'm doing. And uh, once again, because this is an audio medium, not a visual medium, the the tiny little wooden laps that you're reading look nothing like chopsticks. No, they don't. No, no, you, no. You've, um, I think, very adeptly repurposed this particular jig mm. for, for your own ends, and uh, I quite admire the, what, you, what you've done here. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, again, you can find tools to to do things in different industries and different arts, and that's why it's it's important to learn other things, other skills, because then you can you can repurpose that stuff for here. Uh, you know, you, I see a lot of people with their little bench knife reshaping um, pieces of wood or whatever. But actually, little hand planes, little block planes, are much better for reshaping small pieces of wood than a um, than a knife is. You have a lot more control, and they're typically a lot sharper as well. So they're they're actually quite nice for doing that kind of work. And thanks to the way that they're constructed, will generally maintain their edge better mm-hmm. than a bench knife will yep. as well. And you get more precision out of them. So it's there are a lot of good reasons for using using small block planes for shaping pieces of wood for your bench than even even sharpening your pencil. You can you can certainly sharpen your pencil with it quite easily as well. So th- there's a lot of good reasons to have a nice little block plane available in a in a watch making studio. Well, you've certainly made some excellent progress here with your your chamfers and the. The flat edge that, that you've chosen and complements really nicely that speckled finish that, that mm. you've gotten with the, the ruby bead blasting medium. I know it's not an easy journey learning how to, to do all these things and, and dialing this in. It can kind of feel frustrating at times, like you're kind of down in that, that valley of, of despair every now and then. Uh, but I, I think your your next set of, of bridges will, will come along even faster and you, you'll probably be able to, to knock out you know the next 25 sets much faster than you've been able to knock out these 10 sets. I think you can also take heart as well in the fact that even Philippe Dufour's own daughter sort of <laughs> readily admits to like the work that is required to, to try and execute in this sort of realm and level of finishing. I mean, the reverence and, and admiration with which, uh, and fear almost, with which, <laughs> which she spoke uh, of her father's own, own anglage and beveling mm. work as she is now training up to come alongside him and then eventually someday carry on his 
brand and, and the heritage of what it is he, he has created here in his timepieces to, to take up that mantle. I really admire and respect the, the amount of grit and perseverance and, and determination that, that she exudes in having pursued her, her studies. And mm. um, I mean, she has certainly has a, a number of factors that were working against her in a, a primarily male-dominated industry. Mm. It's just really great to, to have, have seen that. There was recently a, an interview that was published with her and, and her father on the Watches TV. And I think it's a really great thing to, to go and check out if those of you listening haven't, haven't seen that yet. Kudos to you for, for sticking with it and, and keeping on persisting. I think she, she certainly inherited a good deal of that from, from her father as well, who has certainly shown a, a knack for persevering through mm-hmm. all sorts of, of, of hiccups and, and ups and downs and just the, the sheer determination it takes to be able to execute watches as he has done over the, the length of time that he has and for the amount of time that a number of those pieces took him to, to finish and to execute. It, it really is remarkable. The, the first watch that she did, the first simplicity watch that she did was, was for herself. And, uh, and it is remarkable seeing, seeing the work, the level of work that she's doing on there. And of course she's got an incredible opportunity learning from her father. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what she ends up doing with this and where she ends up going. It's always challenging when you're when you're going to a second generation of any kind of business, and particularly when you're dealing with one that has artistic implications like watchmaking, and how do you capture that in the next generation? And it looks like Danielle is going to do a great job of it. It's that that interview was great. I always love seeing Philippe's shop, and it's always nice seeing new video from Philippe and and getting new you know new insights from him. And, uh, and that, so that interview was, was excellent. It was, uh, it was really worthwhile watching. Thanks for listening to Off Hours. You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop, and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Silver underscore hand.